Hello, everyone. So today we're interviewing a uh, Michael Millerman. So uh, I just want to first thank uh, Zoltan for letting me uh, host on his channel. He was unable to make it today because of the timing and all that, but I'll, I'll be uh, hosting this instead. So I just want to give a brief uh, sort of overview of who Michael Millerman is. So he's an award-winning political philosophy scholar and teacher. He earned his PhD in political science from the University of Toronto in 2018 for his work on Heidegger and political theory. His first book, beginning with Heidegger, Strauss, Rorty, Derrida, Dugan, and the Philosophical Constitution of the Political, has been called has been called an essential guide to passionate thinking. And I've actually, I actually read that book about a year or so ago, and I, I can confirm it is a good book. Today, he is one of the foremost experts on Alexander Dugan, the most dangerous philosopher in the world, several of whose books he has translated. And just, you know, this is just me uh, sort of speaking here, but from all the research I've done on Dugan, I have to, I have to say Michael Millerman is probably in, in, uh, in the West, probably one of the most objective scholars on Dugan um, who doesn't just, you know, engage in pure, um, you know, ideology or slander of some sort. At his online school, millermanschool.com, Michael offers courses on Plato, Aristotle, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Strauss, Dugan, and others. He's also founded, co uh, he also co-founded Vision X Forum, visionxforum.com, an applied philosophy program for entrepreneurs, and he lives in Montreal with his wife and three children. So Michael Millerman, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so the topic of the discussion that we wanted to talk about really was um, Alexander Dugan, um, which many of you might know me for doing various videos about and you know writing uh, some articles on. Of uh, specifically, well, we wanted to delve into some more, um, not just like sort of the bare bones stuff, but go into some more depth about who Dugan is, not necessarily who he is, but what his philosophy is, and some of the sources that he uses, and some of the uh, the real foundations of his philosophy um, that you won't necessarily get just from reading some of the stuff that's available in English. So specifically uh, with regards to some of his views on Heidegger and some other things. So uh, Michael, did you have any um, things you wanted to start off with or should we just go ahead and get into it? We can go right into it. Yeah, sure. So I wanted to first sort of talk about how uh, Dugan uses a uh, Martin Heidegger in his philosophy, because I know for Dugan, when he talks about for his fourth political theory, so he talks about how the first political theory being that being capitalism, liberalism, the sort of political subject is the individual. For the second theory, that being like, you know, communism, socialism, it's the class. And for the third political theory being like, you know, fascism um, and other varieties, it's the, either the state or the race or something along those lines. And then, but for mm -hmm. the fourth political theory, Dugan says it's Dasein. And that's a concept from that he's borrowing heavily on from Martin Heidegger. So could you perhaps elucidate what exactly it means for Dasein to be the political subject of the fourth political theory? Sure. So here, uh, people who don't know Heidegger's philosophy would have a great opportunity to start to learn about it. And one of the ways that you could see Heidegger's significance for Dugan in Dugan's own terms is by looking at his first Heidegger book, which is available in English. It's called Martin Heidegger, Philosophy of Another Beginning. And there Dugan presents three phases or three, as it were, uh, components of Heidegger's thinking, starting from the middle period writings. And I'll explain all of this in a minute. For Dugan, these middle period writings are very important because they provide a key to the history of philosophy. And Heidegger is telling philosophy had a beginning, a middle and an end. It began with the pre-Socratics, with the first people to begin to raise the question of the meaning of being, what it is to be, and the relationship between being and uh, speaking and thinking. And in Heidegger's retelling, this original moment, the first beginning of philosophy, it sets the thinking of being down a certain path that culminates in Nietzsche. So Heidegger's dedicated many volumes to this um, trajectory. And Dugan finds in it the key to the possibility of the fourth political theory for the following reason. When he rejects liberalism, communism, and fascism, he says that what they have in common is that they are modern. So it's not just that communism was vicious and fascism was racist or this, that, and the other thing. At a philosophical level, it's that they shared the presuppositions of modernity. And what that means for Dugan, following Heidegger, is that they shared a certain interpretation of subjectivity and of identity, of history, and so on. So in rejecting the three political theories, he also rejects the 
end of the first history of philosophy. And now most of the people who read Heidegger in the West, they tend to focus like the French Heideggerians, let's say Derrida, they tend to focus on the deconstructive elements of Heidegger's thinking, where it kind of looks like this. If you're talking about truth or subjectivity, we take Heidegger's history of philosophy to that concept, and we show how for Heidegger it's somehow historically constituted, or it fits somewhere into a historical spectrum. And then you sort of remove the foundations from it, you remove the footing from it, you make it, you free it up, loosen it up, and you have a bit more opportunity there to be playful, so to speak, with your categories. But what they don't focus on, and Dugan does focus on, using these middle period writings, is the idea that Heidegger had of another beginning of philosophy, another inception, that the history that has come to an end contains in itself a kind of secret, a kind of destiny, and that that destiny is there for the philosopher to think through. And when you think it through, you inaugurate another beginning of philosophy. The crucial idea for Dugan, not necessarily so easy to grasp quickly and on the spot, but that's one way that Heidegger is important for him. And that, what I just described, is the first of the three sections of Dugan's first book on Heidegger. Um, then there's another part of Heidegger's writing, which talks about a notion. This is a difficult and, again, kind of obscure notion that you wouldn't necessarily see in the book, The Fourth Political Theory, but it's important for Dugan, of the fourfold. The fourfold, I'm going to try to give it to you as simply and as quickly as I can. It's like this. What is the relationship between earth, world, man, and gods, or God? Earth, world, slash sky, man, and gods. So you have these four elements, these four fundamental dimensions or domains. And Heidegger, on the basis of his understanding of what things are and what we are, tries to present something about this configuration. World, earth, man, gods. And Dugan makes a lot of that in his first Heidegger book as well. So here's what the contrast is. You could say that each period in the history of political philosophy, or put slightly differently, each different ideology has a different interpretation of what the gods are, whether one or many or any, what man is, what earth is, for example, uh, just there for resources, standing reserve, something to be conquered, maybe something uh, holy or sacred, okay, and what uh, world, welt, slash, uh, sky is. So it's kind of like this fourfold, this fourfold is kind of like the underlying fundamental ontological matrix that ideologies interpret in different ways. And in Heidegger's retelling, we've become far removed from the proper configuration. Another way of putting it is that our field of reference has become very distorted. So in his uh, first book on Heidegger, Dugan traces those distortions using that model of the fourfold, and he gives some suggestions for a new way of looking at these things, the relationship between man and God, earth and world, and so on. And then finally, in most Western texts on Heidegger, you start with a focus on being in time, on Dasein, on the existential analytic, which I can explain something about in a second, but that's the third part of Dugan's book. He says, uh, I, Dugan, depart from the typical Western presentation of Heidegger because what they prioritize, Dasein, I think it gets its significance only in light of these other two considerations, in light of the inceptual thinking and of the fourfold. Then Dasein gets its right proportions. So that's even his introductory text on Heidegger is very important for what it emphasizes and the order of presentation. Okay, so now, that's like a little bit about where you could get started with it. There are small suggestions in the fourth political theory about what I just said, but they're really just made in passing. So Dasein, for our purposes, basically means what is it to be a human being prior to, or as it were, behind the interpretations that we automatically give ourselves? So somebody might say, I'm a body, soul, and spirit. Somebody else might think about themselves in terms of evolutionary bi biology or evolutionary psychology. Someone else might think about themselves however else they do. The idea is that all of these different ways of thinking about ourselves are interpretations 
that are taking place on the basis of a more fundamental structure, existential structure. And Heidegger's goal in Being in Time is to bring that underlying fundamental structure to light. In bringing it to light, we get the presentation of Dasein. And Dugan says, when we're trying to construct a new political theory or a new political philosophy or looking for this new actor, let's go there because it escapes modernity. It offers us a lot of resources for thinking about a critique of technological alienation, a critique of end of history, uh, you know, because you can't think about Dasein without also thinking about our relationship towards time and temporality. So you're not going to have a straightforward progressivism or a straightforward traditionalism. You're actually going to go into the roots of what it means for the human being to be temporal as such. So it's a rich intellectual project. There's no easy, simple one line answer for what Dasein means for Dugan, but it's like, let me, let's say this last thing about it. A person who felt as though today we're in some sort of crisis, political, ideological, moral, intellectual, and so on, might wonder where should I turn to for thoughtful, profound, well-elaborated intellectual resources to help me with my problem, uh, to help me with my crisis and my situation. Some schools of thought today are saying, let's turn to the Bible, study the Old Testament, the New Testament, let's return to the Bible. Some are saying let's return to 18th and 17th century natural law thinking, or let's turn to the uh, tradition of Catholic natural law thinking in Aquinas. Dugan's answer is let's turn to the most profound philosopher of the last definitely 100, uh, 200 years, if not 1,000, 2,000 years, somebody who seems to have completed the history of Western philosophy, shut one door, and opened another door to its next 2000 year history. So that's Heidegger for Dugan. He's uh, the most important foundation of Dugan's fourth political theory. And then another important aspect of Dugan is his ethnosociology. Um, I think a lot of people really discount um, his ethnosociological works and the role that it plays um, in him developing a fourth political theory and um, I've done videos on the uh, on his ethnosociological works and Dugan as well as a has a um, lecture series on his own uh, ethnosociological works where you can hear it straight from straight from him. And for Dugan, it seems, and uh, I think this kind of goes into the Noah Machia stuff, which is uh, the uh, some untranslated works of Dugan that Dugan is, from my understanding, I think he said that he's focusing pretty much all of his efforts on finishing. Is that right? The Noah Machia. My understanding is it's done now at 24 or so volumes, but uh, okay. it occupied a big period of his work for sure. Yeah. So for Dugan, it, it seems like he's almost like a, in a way, he's almost like a reactionary in the same way that someone like Spangler, I want to get your take on this, and someone like Spangler is a reactionary, where Spangler has this uh, differentiation between culture and civilization. And for Spengler, it seems like in his work, he wants to make sure that we, we are always at the stage of culture and don't go into that more sort of degenerate phase of civilization. It seems like for Dugan as well, although the ethno-sociological stages, there's no like it's not like um, there's no necessity that you have to keep progressing. People are able to make a choice what stage they want to be at the stage of the ethnos, uh, the, which is basically the most fundamental unit. And then the second derivation of the and the narod, and then the next derivation of civil society, and then possibly like some uh, like a post society. It seems like Dugan wants to make sure that we're at the stage of the narod. Um, so in that way, he seems to me kind of to be like Spengler. Uh, I don't say reactionary in like a, um, a negative way, although some people might interpret it as that. And that he wants to stay at the level of the narod and not go into civil society, and especially not go into post society. And it's because it seems like the Narod, he's, it seems to me to be, for Dugan, the best time where Dasein can really sort of come to fruition. What do you think about that? Yeah, so there's a lot uh, There's a lot to say here. Let me just try to make a couple of the points. First of all, Dugan is explicitly a theorist of the Narod, definitely. And let's just say for people who are listening and don't necessarily know, that's the Russian word that in English means people in the sense of peoples, not just in the sense of collection of individuals. So it's parallel in other languages would be like folk, am in Hebrew, okay, laos in Greek. It's the 
quote unquote ethnic sense of people, okay, as a rough first guide. But because Dugin distinguishes between ethnos and narod or ethnos and people, we have to try to keep our terminology clear. So definitely Dugin is a defender, not primarily of ethnic society, not primarily of the nation state, civil society, global society, or post society, but definitely of the narod or of the people. And we need to try to understand why that is. In my view, in the ethnosociology book, he says that when the ethnos transforms into the narod, into the people, into that social form, that's where the tension is highest between the high and the low. That's where, like in eth ethnic society, as you recall from your study of the book, is a kind of closed harmonious circle. And whenever there's a disharmony, the shaman does his operations to restore harmony. But the narod is, number one, the peak of political difference, friend and enemy. It's also the peak tension between the high and the low. And what Dugan says in the Ethnosociology book is that that's where you have the figure of the philosopher enter the picture, as opposed to the shaman. Because the shaman is restoring harmony in this circular society, so to speak. Whereas the philosopher represents a flight, a vertical flight from, from here to there. So the possibility of flight, the possibility of ascent, um, the possibility of exaltation, you could say in some sense, um, the position of the philosopher king is much more in the sociological category of the people, of the narod, than it is in these other, um, in these other social forms. So in my view, that's the key reason we say, we're presented with ethnos, uh, people, nation, state, civil society, post society, global society. In which of those do we have the home of political philosophy, properly speaking? And it seems like on Dugan's account, the answer there is the Narod. Another thing I want to say that's important in this connection is that even though Dugan, as we just mentioned, suggests that Dasein could be the actor of the fourth political theory, he also suggests in a, another formulation that peoples, or people in the sense of peoples, okay, Narod could be the actor of the fourth political theory. And in some of his works, he develops a Heideggerian analysis of peoplehood. So we have a possible parallelism, okay, between Dasein and Narod, Dasein and peoples. So you start to take the tools of Heideggerian existential analysis, Heideggerian history of philosophy, and all of that, everything that Heidegger offered us, and you bring it to bear on peoples which is exactly what Dugan has done with Russian peoplehood. He's taken the tools of Heideggerian philosophy to try to elaborate the meaning of Russian being. The, so his formulation here, in a nutshell, is um, Dasein als Volk. Dasein as people. Dasein as Volk. Okay? So his interpretation of Heidegger moves it into the direction of peoples. Now, I want to say that that has textual warrant in Heidegger's own thinking, because in contributions to, philosophy of, contributions to philosophy of the event, Heidegger says that philosophical thinking must pass through the question, it must pass through meditation on peoples. It must raise the question, um, what is a people? And it recognizes that philosophy is always, quoting Heidegger here, philosophy is always philosophy of a people. So German philosophy, Greek philosophy. The fact that there's that um, adjective or qualifier and that it's folkish, Greek, German, whatever the case may be, Russian in the case of Dugan's project, it's not accidental, it's essential according to Heidegger. So Dugan in following Heidegger has all the warrant he needs to make people's uh, center piece of his thought. And then just one other thing I want to add here about Noomachia. Noomachia, in my one statement, uh, one sentence restatement of what it is, it's a philosophical analysis of civilizational multipolarity. And there's a link. I know you did a great video on the fourth political theory book, and we're not revisiting the basics of it. But when I teach Noomachia, I try to show the connection between the end of the fourth political theory and the start of this project. Because what Dugan says uh, towards the end of the fourth political theory is that you're opposing American unipolar hegemony geopolitically and ideologically and in terms of the system of sciences. So basically the dominance of the American liberal way of world interpretation is going to be uh, attacked. And the idea is that it's going to be replaced with multipolarity. This is maybe already familiar to people who work 
on or who read or have some interest in Dugan. Multipolarity is a key word. But what he says in the fourth political theory is that the coming multipolar world must be noetic in some way, reflecting the multipolarity of nous itself. Nous, the Greek word for intellect, nous is in itself differentiated and multipolar. And when Dugan says that the coming multipolar world must be noetic, he's making a clear connection between how we think about the geopolitical plane and linking it up to how we think about the noetic plane. So there are some multipolar thinkers for whom there is no noetic plane. All they care about is that there are several centers of power. They have their reason for wanting that or for not wanting it. But Dugan explicitly connects the imperative of multipolarity to the fact of Noose's own uh, differentiated structure. And it's that issue, Noose's own differentiated structure, that Dugan focuses on in the first methodological volume of No Omachia. So there's like that connection. And uh, it's important to see that those two things are not just like separately lying on the table with no link between them. They're intimately and essentially connected. Oh, one other thing here just about the Spangler. Dugan explicitly says that although some theorists of civilization, like Spangler, make a distinction between culture and civilization, when he deals with uh, Noamakia, he says that he's not going to be following that as a rule unless some theorist he's talking about, ha like Spangler, makes that division, in which case he'll underline it. So Dugan does not a priori operate with Spangler's division between culture and civilization. He's primarily focused on showing difference and diversity, you could say, but not in our superficial post-liberal way, where you're only diverse if you're a different, if you're gay in a different way, but some sort of fundamental deep diversity. And the depth, the dimension of depth is here once again to come full circle, brought down to the existential level. So that Dugan's philosophical analysis of civilizational multipolarity is also a Heideggerian analysis of peoples. So that's always trying to take it down to that fundamental level, show the differences, not superficially, and see what we can learn about a rich, a variegated world uh, in that way. And so he has some methods for doing that, but that's how everything ties together in my view. Thank you. And I know um, I saw one of your videos where you were going through, I don't know where it was from, but you were. I think you were reading from Heidegger and his critique of Spengler and it seems mm -hmm. to me like, um, and I've been reading some Heidegger recently too, like the uh, the basic writings that like, you know, that big little red book. And uh, for instance, in like Letter on Humanism, his critique of like uh, people like Sartre and even like other philosophers, he does this critique a lot where he says that they're in the realm of metaphysics and not in the realm of ontology. So do you think that perhaps like Dugan is trying to do something like, uh, I, I don't want to tether him too much to Spengler, but let's just use him for the sake of reference, trying to do like some like Spenglerian analysis, but on ontologically instead of uh, metaphysically, like sort of taking Heidegger's critique of people like Spengler and trying to do a more ontological within metaphysical like understanding or analysis. Yeah, that's part of it. So let me just make a possibly useful distinction here uh, for the people who are listening, as I see it between metaphysics and ontology on the basis of uh, Dugan's attitude to Heidegger. To think metaphysically means to think in terms of the philosophical concepts of the first history of philosophy, from the pre-Socratics to Nietzsche. To think ontologically, pr somehow properly speaking here, fundamental ontology, is to think more deeply or outside of the limits of that first history of philosophy. So Heidegger specifically says that metaphysics is the name for the first history of philosophy. And fundamental ontology or inceptual thinking is the name for the new beginning of philosophy. Now, why is metaphysics thought of like that? Because metaphysics answered the question, what is being, on the basis of the question, what are beings? Metaphysics means to think about being as that which is common to beings, that which makes them what they are. 
In other words, it's somehow derivative from thinking about beings. It's not our thought leaping directly into the question of being. It's a detour that we take to being through beings. Heidegger calls that metaphysics, and he thinks that it's one way, but not the way that we need now. The way that we need now is the leap into being without that detour. Hi, uh, Dugan follows that. As I say, he placed Heidegger's conceptual thinking at the heart of his first presentation of Heidegger in that book, Philosophy of Another Beginning. And therefore, when he thinks about civilization, culture, peoples, and so on, he's definitely doing it or trying to do it in the mode of fundamental ontology slash conceptual thinking and not in the mode of metaphysics. And conversely, you could say, his criticism of the first three political theories is that they are metaphysical as opposed to conceptual. Therefore, they're still alienated from man's essence rather than reflecting, uh, reflecting how we are rooted in being. Um, yes, that's, that's accurate. Um, that's what I would say. One other thing, though, just to be clear. So it's not like the Nootomachia book series is full-blown Heideggerian analysis through and through. The methodological volume gets us to think about how Heidegger's philosophy shows us the essence of civilizational difference, the essence of how people differ. But just I want to be very clear that Dugan's ordering or organizing principle in Nootomachia is the idea that there are three fundamentally irreducible ways that peoples and places interpret themselves in the world. And he gives initially the names Apollonian, Dionysian, and Sibelian, or less mythologically, the light logos, the dark logos, and the black logos, to these three fundamental modes of world interpretation. And somehow the task that's left for readers of Nootomachia is to think through and reason through how those three fundamental modes of world configuration relate to the level of fundamental ontology and existential analysis. Dugan also says, for those people who haven't read it, and I assume that many people have not, uh, even though parts of it are available, by the way, now in English, not in print form, but online at, I think it's like Eurasian-archive.org or something like that. But anyway, um, so you have these three log logoi, Apollonian, Dionysian, and Sibelian, light, dark, and black. And Dugan says that, uh, look, maybe there are more, maybe some other people sees itself in other terms. So he's flexible with this categorization, but he says that it's going to be his methodological a starting point in this philosophical analysis of civilizations. Uh, so yeah, it's not metaphysical, it's ontological. It's focused not only on nous, but on logos. As I say, light logos, dark logos, black logos, three modes of world interpretation. And there you have it. That's uh, that's kind of what Nootomachia looks like. Uh, so two questions. So the first one, just uh, do you know what he says about the uh, the current American uh, logos? Like what logos are we? So I haven't read his volume on the American logos, but one of the things, if you listen to some of the recent interviews, I mean, like earlier this year that he's done, you'll see not necessarily in terms of the logoi, but he identifies what's uniquely American as a, pragmat as a pragmatism. And his account of pragmatism is captured in part, I think, in my chapter on Rorty in Beginning with Heidegger, but he characterizes American thought as primarily uh, pragmatism, which doesn't just mean like do what's useful. It has something to do with um, the relationship between nothingness and the world of our making. So he did an interview, I think it was with uh, Jack Murphy live. Uh, he did maybe two interviews and one of them he gets into his details on pragmatism there. But what I find is that when we take the model of the, th of the three logoi and we try to think through the state of contemporary American, let's say, culture wars, it becomes pretty clear that you, you know, the Western world somehow is primarily at the moment under the dominance of the logos of Sibylle, the black logos, the logos of the great mother. And there are many reasons for that. Probably the gender uh, issues are the most um, conspicuous because one of the things that Dugan says characterizes the mythological side of the Logos of Sibylle or the Great Mother 
or the black logos is a myth of castration. So the, the castrated male and, uh, you know, all talk about the crisis of masculinity. I'll talk about, uh, transgenderism and the, everything that, as I say, is most conspicuous on the gender side of things is best captured by the logos of the great mother. And another way to see it is that the logos of Sibylle is the postmodern part of what we've become, and even partially the modern, modern part of what we've become, and that somehow a restoration of the roots of Western greatness or the roots of Western identity, those people who want to cast off the postmodern occupation of the Western uh, mind, uh, who want to reopen the closed Western soul, they want to restore, in Dugan's terms, you know, if we use them, it could be like a restoration of the alliance between Apollo and Dionysus, a restoration of the alliance between uh, tragedy uh, and comedy, or between the Bible and philosophy. You know, those parts of the Western tradition that made it what it is, that are now under the gun, you could map out as the dominance of the logos of Sibylle over the Apollonian and the Dionysian. So it gives us some nice tools to work with. For example, I have a course in Millerman School called Philosophical Analysis of uh, Manliness or of Masculinity. And there's a lecture there on Noomaki and how we can use this to do this kind of analysis. See, well, how did we get to the gender politics stage of things from that perspective? And what would it look like to restore uh, Apollo? What would it look like to restore Dionysus? And so on. One thing I'll add here is that in Dugan's view, it's not the case that like, a people or a civilization is either Apollonian, Dionysian, or Sibelian. All three of them are always at play in different proportions. So there may be elements of Western society today that are still Dionysian or that are still Apollonian, but his method is to try to separate the threads, see which one is dominant and where the other ones are present and so, sort of how they're configured. But, uh, but it's not as simple as saying, Russia's Dionysian, Germany's Apollonian, America's uh, Sibelian. Everybody is mixed in their proportions. So now I want to, with regards to the, um, with Dugan's multipolarity, it's not just about, as you said, various sort of centers of power being distributed throughout the world, various poles of power, uh, multiple poles of power. It's also a noetic thing. So does that tie in at all to like the postmodernism that Dugan is influenced by? Not, I know that he has a sort of weird relationship, not necessarily weird, but he has a, a relationship with postmodernism in which he likes that it critiques sort of modernity. And he sort of sees it as a tool to destroy modernity. Almost, it seems to me, to bring us back to a sort of more pre-modern time. And I don't say that derogatorily. Um, so is part of the noetic multipolarity related at all to his postmodernism? Well, let's see. So if we start with uh, postmodernism, postmoderns developed a critique of modernity. And in that sense, they are positive for Dugan because Dugan thinks that modernity is deserving of a critique. But their critique of modernity was a development or a continuation or extension of the basic impulses of modernity, like especially the emancipatory impulses of modernity. And since he's opposed to those, he is critical of the dominant trends of postmodernity. So if we can borrow, as it were, their insights about the limitations of modernity, but reject their solutions to the extent to which they're primarily focused on this emancipatory uh, impulse, then there's something to work within. So. I have personally found it helpful. And the first time I had this thought was working on Dugan back as an undergraduate. It's helpful to distinguish left and right postmodernity. Left postmodernity, therefore, we could put everything that he criticizes as postmodern under that. And right postmodernity, for quick little bookkeeping purposes, we can put him there for a minute and say, yes, a critique of modernity that takes into account the people who stood at the end of the process, Nietzsche, Heidegger, first and foremost, but not only. So some people who want to return, take to Amer take, oh, let me just finish that thought. So the right post-modernity would be one that also criticizes and rejects modernity, isn't just a naive reactionary pre-modernism, but takes into account the insights of Heidegger and Nietzsche and tries to have some other uh, configuration than the left postmoderns do. 
There are some not really philosophical thinkers today, I would say, who are against neo-Marxist, postmodern, woke left, and they propose to do some sort of return to modernity. Some of them return maybe to medieval or to pre-modern, but mostly a, like a return to modernity, let's say, but without having processed the import and the impact of the great critics of modernity, like Nietzsche and Heidegger. So that's what sets Dugan apart from those other kinds of naive conservative or liberal conservative thinkers. He takes seriously all, not only Heidegger and Nietzsche, as I said, Spangler and all of the other people who intuited or divined that we're at the end of a cycle, including Gwenon, Evola, that we're not able to just go back. So even in the fourth political theory book, as you know from your lectures on it, uh, he specifically says that he's not just turning back the clock. He doesn't fall into the category of those people who just want to say no to modernity and yes to pre-modernity. So it's more accurate, I would say, to see that Dugan is hitting modernity from two flanks, pre-modern and post-modern. Both of them are in play. And at first, with equal rights, whether we are postmodern, so to speak, with Heidegger, or pre-modern, so to speak, with Plato, we're putting modernity in the pincers between the beginning and end of philosophy. Uh, that's, his, uh, that's his strategy. You remember in the Fourth Political Theory book, he says, to the extent that we're rejecting modernity, everything that modernity itself uh, per made peripheral or marginalized is back in play, including myth and archaics, including all of the pre-modern, but equally, as I say, all of the post-modern. Hence also Dugan's fascination, probably too strong a word, but his respect for and his use of figures like uh, Deleuze, for example, and other um, experimental combinations of, you know, how do we take this postmodern thinker with his genuine insights into the limitations of uh, capital and combine him with this pre-modern thinker and his insights into some other thing? So suddenly when you have a, when you give equal rights to the postmodern and the pre-modern, you have more opportunity for creative experimentation, combination, and uh, just more forces to bring to bear in the anti-modern uh, crusade. Did you see that? I just want to, your thoughts real quick. Did you see that, uh, I think it was a Yaron uh, Brooks of the Ayn Rand Institute, I believe. And his, he did a sort of like a reaction to like watching an interview with Alexander Dugan. Did you see that? Or I thought that was so pretty So I funny. didn't watch it. I didn't watch it. I saw that he did a video like that. Uh, I do see from time to time, there are people who make criticisms of Dugan, but my, I so many times have experienced their, uh, the limitations of their research on Dugan, you know, like they'll either take one small thing and dedicate two hours to it, or they show that they've never read any of his books or they read his books, but they never read any Heidegger and therefore wouldn't necessarily be well equipped to judge what he has to say. Um, you know, I don't watch every critical video like that of Dugan that comes out. Although, you know, what did you find about it? That was, uh, that hit the mark or that missed the mark or what was your impression of it? So I didn't watch the whole thing. I sort of like maybe watched like, it was like a two hour, I think it was like a two, almost three hour thing. I maybe watched like 20, 30 minutes just sort of scrubbing around, but he was complaining a lot about Dugan's, um, anti-methodological individualism, mm -hmm. as well as mm -hmm. he basically from, at least from what I saw, he kept lambasting him as a, so just a right wing postmodern, um, which I, which I found was interesting. Yeah, so again, there's there's something to that formally, as I say, if we take postmodernity as a category and we take the dominant trends of postmodernity and recognize that they're rough that they're on the left and that they're still uh, too modern and we open up the possibility of a right-wing postmodernity. So that's just an exercise in like rough categorization. But it doesn't yet tell us, you know, the important things that we need to know about the basis of the critique of modernity, the basis of the critique of individualism. So fundamentally, philosophically, that's Heidegger. There are other sources. I'll give you my favorite example. Uh, not that it's the only one. I learned about this person through Dugan. Other people may already know who he is, but Henri Corbin or Henry Corbin, Henri Corbin probably is how you say it. He was the first person to translate fragments of Heidegger into French. And he was also a scholar of Islamic mysticism. 
uh, I learned about this, as I say, through Dugan. But what Henri Corbin allows us to do is to have a kind of um, Rosetta Stone or type, you know, a sort of a translation operation that moves us from the German philosophy of Martin Heidegger to certain trends in Islamic mysticism. Uh, thinking about Ibn Arabi and the creative imagination, thinking about Sufism, the hidden Imam, all of these kinds of things. And those models of understanding also are not methodologically individualist, uh, individualistic. So the, there are going to be some people who are so committed to their current mode of world interpretation that it's enough for them to look at Dugan and see that he rejects that. And that's what they need to know. So like we're nationalists, Dugan is an anti-nationalist, therefore Dugan is out of the picture. Or we're individualists, Dugan is an anti-individualist, therefore, you know, I can have a two hour video on the dangers of anti-individualism. But there have to be some among us, like uh, yourself, and I'm sure some of the people who watch this and are listening to it, who want to go deeper than that and say, well, what's the basis? You know, Heidegger gave us a thoughtful account of the limitations of interpreting the human being as an individual. Now, Heidegger has a different notion, the self, selbst. And Dugan has written about that in several of his books on Heidegger. But a person who was criticizing Dugan slash Heidegger for being anti-individualistic would have to have like lingered long enough with Heidegger's thinking to be able to say, well, how is the individual like or unlike the self in Heidegger's thinking? Isn't the self the individual? Why does he have two different words for two different notions and think that they're so radically different? In other words, this isn't as easy as reading, you know, the ingredients on a, a pack of food in the supermarket where you're like, okay, it has this, it doesn't have that. It gives me this, it doesn't give me that. It requires a lot of, uh, a lot of work. And I know that I'm not trying to be dismissive of, uh, of Yaron Brooks or of other people who write about uh, who write about Dugan because in their own spheres, they're very knowledgeable. And I know, I don't mean to suggest that they're lazy in everything they do. You know, they probably could run circles around us when it comes to the topics of their uh, expertise. But I'm just trying to emphasize here that when we try to do an adequate analysis of Dugan, when we try to do an adequate analysis of Heidegger, it's the same thing. You know, you have to just... Um, get into it like that. But there's always there's always the possibility, you know, from Apollo's point of view, you criticize Sibylle. From Sibylle's point of view, you criticize Apollo. From Dionysus' point of view, if it's just like from the point of view of the first political theory, Dugan looks like this. From the point of view of the communist, he looks like that. From the point of view of the fascist, there are other things not to like about him. But that's all like super mechanical, super structural, doesn't really involve much thinking. It's just about putting the recognizing that you're dealing with two different axiom systems. Um, yeah, there you go. So the a, a liberal individualist would have the most to gain, in my view, from Dugan by digging into, well, what was Heidegger's account of the limitations of the interpretation of the human being as an individual? So I want to turn now to um, Dugan's concept, or I, know, I don't know if it's a concept, but he says a lot of things um, in a lot of his writings, especially his English, the stuff that's at least I've read it that's translated into English, um, about how the future is open, history is open. So I'm I'm thinking right now of how Marxist and their critique of capitalism, where they basically say that in order to overcome capitalism, we have to basically fulfill the revolution of bourgeois society the right way. And then they have this whole dialectic and you can't overcome capitalism. The only way to overcome capitalism is through their very specific and very narrow, in my opinion, view that we have to fulfill the bourgeois revolution. And that's how we're going to, that's the only way to overcome capitalism and go on to the next stage. But Dugan, he says that history is open. The future is open. So I was wondering if you could uh, speak something uh, about that. Yes. So he does say the future is open, history is open. Things depend on our actions. They depend on our decisions. We're not just bound by some predetermined logic of history. There are many possible logics. They differ from place to place, from time to time, from moment to moment. And there are acts and, and decisions. Um, 
moments here where the possibility field collapses, not in and of itself, but because of what we chose to do. So it's, for example, not a foregone conclusion. Take a very simple type of uh, example here. It's not a foregone conclusion that the world will become multipolar. Okay, Russia is fighting for, um, from one perspective, Russia's war in Ukraine is a war for a multipolar world, but it could lose and the unipolar world could get stronger if Russia loses, for example, or it could win and the multipolar world could get stronger. There's no historical necessity and you can't just read off the history's trajectory and say what's going to happen. It's open, you know, it's uh, every moment. Okay, so I'll tell you, the best source, in my view, available in English for Dugan's thoughts on uh, history, time, and action, political action in particular, is in the book called The Rise of the Fourth Political Theory, which people who have read The Fourth Political Theory, I recommend having those two volumes together. In The Rise of the Fourth Political Theory, it's nice because there's a section on, I think it's called Horizons of Political Temporality what it means from Heidegger's perspective to be oriented towards the past, present, and future. And uh, the idea of a project, the idea of a political project, you know, that you're going to try to bring something into being that does not currently exist, you're going to try to bring it into being, right? Again, that's not, it's not going to, in and of itself, come about. Uh, that is bound up with the possibility of political action, political decision. And political projects, again, rooted here in Heidegger's uh, terminology, they can be authentic or inauthentic. Your, the world that you're bringing about through your action or that you're facilitating through your inaction, it can vary according to whether it's authentic or inauthentic, whether it's based on a rootedness or on an uprootedness, on clear sight or on muddy vision, uh, on understanding or on lack of understanding. So. Yes, Dugan has a different account than Marx, a different account than Hegel, a different account than anybody who sees history as a deterministic process, for sure. Um, he doesn't see it as, yeah, he doesn't see it as all accident. So you might say, okay, history doesn't does not have a directionality, it does not have a rationality, it does not have the determinacy, it's all just some sort of chaotic uh, accident, chance, whatever happens, happens. That's not his view. You can flip the switch from inauthenticity to authenticity. You can go from the end of history or the disappearance of time to the re you know, to a new inauguration of political temporality. So it is worth trying to position Dugan in relation to other thinkers of politics and time, like you say, Hegel, Marx, Kojev, uh, and, and so on. Fukuyama, obviously related to Hegel and Kojev. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the way that he sees it. So the question, for example, uh, for Russia, as you remember from the introduction to the fourth political theory, is to be or not to be. You can't look to the historical process to answer that. You can only look to whether or not Russia can flip the switch, become authentic, embrace a self-understanding that is um, appropriate, and defend its civilizational sovereignty in a unipolar world. And if it doesn't do that, then it'll disappear. If it manages to do that, then it can live to fight another day. So would Dugan call unipolarity then inauthentic? Because that's what it seems like. There's like um, there's those two chapters in the middle of the fourth political theory that are the ones, I, I forgot the name of them, um, the ones that are a bit sort of um, apocalyptic almost. It seems to, it seems to me that he was talking about the one po at least one possible future of unipolarity where we sort of become these post humans. So would he call that yeah. inauthentic, or would he say you can have authentic post humanism or transhumanism? Okay, it's a good question. Uh, I think that for Dugan, you could not have authentic post humanism because, and I may be wrong, but this is just you know on the spot thinking this through as best as I can. Authenticity characterizes a mode of human being. So a post-human society or a post-human species, it no longer has authenticity as a possible 
mode of being, or we'd have to leave it an open question. But as things stand, authenticity is a possible way of human being. And therefore, if we're talking about the post-human, it's not clear whether or not um, it could have that possibility. So first of all, end of history and the thought of time, obviously, as you know, from fourth political theory, those things are related. The possibility that time could come to an end, that man's historic, his, not his, not his historicity could collapse in on itself so that there's no more history. You know, historicity is a term from being in time. The fact that man's historicity could collapse in on itself and that man has the possibility of dis becoming destroyed in his temporality, all of that is deeply significant for Dugan. And he marshals the resources, as you know, of Husserl and other phenomenologists to try to understand this. Now, I want to point out, since at the start, you said you want to go into some of like the esoteric or not so well known aspects of Dugan's thought. We're here dealing with, I think, the most fascinating esoteric part of Dugan's thought, which is a notion that he mentions in the fourth political theory, but and incidentally, also in the Great Awakening versus the Great Reset. But he just mentions it in a way that you don't know exactly what he's talking about or how it relates or where he's developed it elsewhere. And that's the notion of the radical subject. So people who are familiar with the basic principles of the fourth political theory and who are learning today about Nomachia and these other things and who want to take a further step into the deep recesses of Dugan's thought where not everybody is permitted to go. You have to sort of uh, knock three times and have the right qualifications look into the figure of the radical subject. Because one of the questions that Dugan raises is why should there, what is it in us that made possible the collapse of our temporality at all? Why should something like an end of history have been possible in principle, even if we oppose it? You know, fine, we have this dark night of the soul, we have the collapse of our temporality, we have the idea that history has ended, there's a rebellion against it, and okay, we have a new spark, a new conflagration, a new, uh, a new history, but still we have to go to this moment and say, wait a minute, what, what just happened? What was that? What snuffed out the light of temporality in us even momentarily? And that's like, uh, you have to go there, Dugan says, in order to discover a deep dimension and a, and a concealed dimension of human existence that he calls the radical subject. And he's, he has amazing lecture courses on this topic in Russian, unfortunately not available in English, not translated, um, not well known and definitely not distributed or anything. And it's a shame because they're amazing lecture courses that connect uh, phenomenology. So study of uh, intentionality of consciousness, lecture courses where he mentions Brentano, Husserl, uh, Meister Eckhart, okay, Jakob Bem, and other figures, and that transitions into this study of the possibility of that collapse of temporality that I mentioned. Um, that's the most interesting esoteric aspect of his thought, I think, but its day in English is uh, still off in the future. Uh, that's how few resources there are out there about it. One other thing here on this topic, Dugan does not often write in the materials that we have available in English, um, autobiographically. Okay, so he gives us geopolitical analysis, ethnosociological analysis, and all of that, ideological analysis. But there's one place where you do see him talking autobiographically, a kind of uh, philosophical autobiography, and it touches on this very point. I think you can find in English and I strongly recommend that you do, uh, a video presentation he gave, I think it's called um, Wherefore Philosophers in Our Time or something like that. Hold on, I have to find this. I hate to be searching anything in the middle of our conversation, but uh, I'll send you the link maybe and you can share it with people because he gives some of the background here. And what you see is that Dugan is not just talking about the radical subject like a concept, my version here is that like many great mystics in the history of religious thought and religious life, he himself underwent this 
uh, trying journey into the black depths of the dark night of the soul. And he came out of it with some hard won privileged insights into the nature of human existence that he encapsulated in this notion of the radical subject. And that became a key for him in understanding the meaning of exoteric political life, like, you know, which empire rises and falls, which country wins or loses, which ideology takes a step forward or a step back. It's called exoteric because that's the outside world. And this gave him the key to understanding the hidden inner significance of those external events. So um, the radical subject, that's a topic that people should learn more about, uh, even though, as I say, the sources are pretty, uh, you know, there aren't many, but there's, there are some. Yeah, I'm looking, um, and I do see a couple of things about the radical subject. Um, I'm not too sure. Yeah, if you could, when you have a time after this, send it over to me. I'll put a link in the chat because I've been interested in that. I remember, funnily enough, I remember reading that chapter of when I do my first read of the fourth political theory. I had read, or I had already read Ethnos and Society. I read it like a year before. I didn't even know who Dugan was. I just thought it was like a cool little book that I got. And then I was like, oh, wow, there's a lot more to this guy than, you know, just this, right? So I remember reading mm -hmm. the fourth political theory, um, that chapter specifically about the radical subject, like at, at night, it was like the last thing I was doing before I went to bed. Like I remember like almost like wanting to sleep with the, with the lights on, right? Just because how like apocalyptic it feels and how like if you really take your time and slowly read through it, you get a real sense of, I don't even know how to describe it's, it's it, almost like dread, like existential dread of, a, of what our world could become if we allow unipolarity and the sort of destruction of like authentic being in the world. Um, it's, it was very, um, very apocalyptic. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I get the impression, you know, it's, it's funny that you should have noticed, uh, noticed that because I get the impression, you know, when people read the great awakening book or when they read the fourth political theory that they will just, somehow knowingly or not their eyes will glaze over those passages on the radical subject because it's they're like uh it's hard to understand when you first see them what they're what they're referring to uh i know people have read the fourth political theory who i would wager didn't dive deep into the chapters on ontology of the future and husserl and all of that and yet you know somehow whenever he writes about these topics that recurs however subtly as the deep theme um the, the what what's really at stake um you know those those deep dimensions of human existence including our temporality are what's at uh, what's at stake but it's somehow also natural that people overlook that because it just maybe seems like gibberish or you know they don't have the they don't have the keys you know so what do you do when the door is locked and you don't have the key you just walk past the door or you, like Leo Strauss said, try to enter through the keyhole. So I know we're running up against a time here, but I want to, uh, as you just mentioned, Strauss here, I did want to ask you about, I don't know if you would call yourself necessarily a Straussian, but I know at least you are, um, you have a lot of respect for Strauss and your influence by him. So I was wondering, how does, how do you use Strauss with Dugan? And does, do you think you get something using that, that other people who aren't familiar with Strauss and his um, sort of works and methodology don't. Yeah, definitely. So for me, taking what I learned about reading and taking what I learned about political philosophy from Strauss and applying that to my study of Dugan has been extremely helpful. I think that if I've been able to make any contribution to the understanding of Dugan's thought in English speaking circles and in Western political science, it's been because I approached him in the spirit that I learned from Strauss, the spirit that I learned to approach political philosophy and uh, great thinkers um, by reading Strauss. So first, let me just say, if anybody has not studied Leo Strauss, I very strongly recommend that you do. If anybody has heard that Strauss is primarily a neoconservative Jewish apologist for invading Iraq, and it still has that kind of connotation, I encourage you to set that aside and actually read Strauss himself because he's an incredible teacher of political philosophy and he's indispensable. Then I would like to just say, to be clear, that my uh, book, Inside Putin's Brain, The Political Philosophy of Alexander Dugan, 
it includes a chapter where I bring Strauss and Dugan very close together and I show exactly how I used Strauss to think through Dugan's significance, where I show their similarities and where I ask about, you know, given the nature of their similarities on all of these questions, how do we make sense of their differences? So absolutely, this mashup of Strauss and Dugan is extremely valuable, or it has been for me. I'll give you a simple example. Strauss says that the greatest thinker of our time is Heidegger. He says we, should, we have to make a very great effort to find a basis for uh, rational liberalism. But here's the great problem. Uh, we need a great thinker, and the only great thinker of our time is Heidegger. And Heidegger is obviously anti-liberal. So Strauss recognizes liberalism is facing a problem. We need the greatest thinker to help us through the problem, but the greatest thinker is an anti-liberal. A very real problem and a well-stated and accurate representation of the situation. But that means that both Strauss and Dugan regard Heidegger as the greatest thinker. Both Strauss and Dugan try to reason about Heidegger's meaning for liberalism and for liberal democracy and for thinking man, okay, for anybody today who has uh, attraction towards philosophy and uh, that kind of thing. They both use Heidegger and his critique of the history of philosophy or his critique of modernity to return to Plato. This is explicit. So Strauss has credited Heidegger with making possible a return to the study of Plato and Aristotle because it was Heidegger who showed that Plato and Aristotle could not have been refuted since they were never understood. And how did he show that? Through his unparalleled lectures on Plato and Aristotle. So Heidegger makes possible for Strauss a return to the sources of our tradition. And it's the same thing for Dugan. Heidegger makes possible the return to Plato. So they both have an issue with modern liberalism. They both see Heidegger as the key thinker and they both return from Heidegger to Plato. Those are noteworthy similarities. And uh, academic Straussians, they tend not to have a lot of sympathy for the careful study of Dugan. And there are reasons for that, but that's their loss and their problem. I think if we look at the books, we look at the arguments, we look at the phenomena ourselves, then uh, it's an experiment well worth uh, conducting. Like I say, I have some stuff about that in both of my books, actually, because they both write about Heidegger, Strauss, and Dugan. And there you have it. Uh, definitely, definitely, definitely. Anybody listening to this who is interested in making sense of where we are and how we got here, Strauss is, uh, is helpful. The most helpful in my view. Stra Strauss, Dugan, and Heidegger, that's my trifecta. Those are the ones who have helped me to see the most in these questions. So if I'm saying something that you find helpful, those are my teachers. Do you find um, Strauss's, because uh, I, I have a Straussian friend, or not Straussian friend, I'm a friend who's in, really into Heidegger, and he said that uh, Strauss's views on Heidegger are, he didn't really like them. So I was just curious, do you think uh, Strauss has uh, good views on Heidegger? I know you said he both, he says he's the greatest thing of our time, but do you think um, he interprets him correctly, or what would you say about that? Well, let me put it with all due respect to Strauss this way. We definitely learn more from Strauss about other thinkers. So Strauss is not the key source to help us learn about Heidegger. Dugan is a much more helpful source to help us learn about Heidegger. But Strauss is incredibly helpful in understanding Plato, Aristotle, the difference between the ancients and the moderns, in reading and interpreting Nietzsche, Machiavelli, the problem of Socrates, and much more. Okay, but on the specific question of Heidegger, I think Dugan is much more helpful. And that's another reason why I, uh, I rely on him so much. And I always try to push somehow Dugan's Heideggerianism as important in this big picture. So what Strauss said about Heidegger, um, my view in a nutshell, and this is what I argue in the Strauss chapter of my Heidegger book, my view is that Strauss does not have a philosophical refutation of Heidegger. He has a political refutation of Heidegger. That's my view. So when it comes to uh, existential analytic of Dasein, fundamental ontology, the history of being, um, all of that, I am not convinced that Strauss even necessarily fully understood Heidegger. I'm not so sure. But definitely when it comes to the fact that Heidegger overlooked the political phenomena, 
So for example, Heidegger writes about Plato's Republic. He focuses only on the cave allegory and only for the purpose of showing that aletheia, or the word for truth or unconcealment, occurs in four different contexts in the cave allegory. So he zeroes in on just that part of Plato that's focused on the thing that he's most interested in, being truth and so on. Whereas when Strauss reads The Republic, he reads it from the very beginning to the very end with the utmost care and sensitivity and always trying to understand it in light of all of Plato's other dialogues and in light of the problem of Socrates' life and death. Here, Strauss's approach is superior to Heidegger's. Heidegger is too selective. So you have, a, you have a real battle of the giants between Heidegger and Strauss. Heidegger putting an emphasis on the more purely philosophical side and I think understanding it more deeply than Strauss. But Strauss putting an emphasis on the importance of political philosophy and understanding it much more profoundly than Heidegger. So that's how, that's how I would put it. We need, all, we need all three of them. We need Heidegger, Dugan, and Strauss in order to triangulate uh, and get closer to these questions and closer to the issues. Thank you. And uh, I know we are kind of pressed for time here, but do you um, have any sort of last comments that you want to sort of add here about either uh, Dugan and Heidegger or just sort of Dugan in general about how people should approach Dugan? Um, because I know a lot of people have a very, um, you know, they kind of come at it with bad faith, I feel like. So I don't know if you want to say something about that. And then just kind of where people can find you, what you're doing and what projects you have and anything else you want to have. And of course, you can just email me all your links and I'll make sure to put them in the description and all that. Okay, sure. So the spirit in which it's helpful to study Dugan, we're trying to understand what's going on in the world. And he's somebody who has an account of that, which is worth considering. We're trying to understand Russia because it's a pretty serious world player. You know, we are not too many steps away from the possibility of a big conflict between Russia and the West. We want to see something about how Russia interprets itself or understands itself. And Dugan's helpful in that respect. Um, if we recognize, like Strauss and these other thinkers did, the importance of Heidegger, then we should have a keen interest in people who have read Heidegger thoughtfully. Strauss is, excuse me, Dugan is helpful there. So there are many good and justifiable reasons to take Dugan seriously. And it doesn't mean becoming uh, a zealous um, follower of all of Dugan's political statements. It doesn't, look, in general, Education can go in two directions. And education can be indoctrination into a certain kind of propaganda that you just then have like hanging over you and it's the master of your soul and you've become somehow personally fully identified with that dogma or doctrine. Or education can be a serious inquiry into the fundamental alternatives, into the various answers that are given to a set of basic questions. Dugan's fourth political theory whether a person likes or doesn't like its political application is clearly a thoughtful alternative to a basic question about the meaning of political history, the best political order, and the nature of the human being. It's not the only answer, so you shouldn't only study Dugan, but it is an, it is an answer and it's a thoughtful one. It's a relevant one. And for all those reasons, I think he's worth uh, studying. It's just a matter of getting the intention straight. You know, our intention is not to become uh, members of a movement, in my view. Our intention is rather to become people who understand a situation better, ourselves and the world. So I can put in a pitch for the authors I've learned most from, as I say, Dugan, Strauss, Heidegger. And uh, I hope nobody minds if I say that in my school, millermanschool.com, I have courses on all of these thinkers, on Nietzsche, Plato and Aristotle as well. And uh, some of the videos are free. You can just go look at them. Bunch of things on my YouTube channel. And the page that has everything, like my blog posts, YouTube, Twitter, and all of that, michaelmillerman.com. That'll send you everywhere else, okay? My newsletter, my school, and so on. Um, but yeah, we study political philosophy because we're trying to understand the fundamental alternatives to the big questions that concern us, that affect us, and that's an amazing project, whoever's helpful there. You may know of authors, uh, you yourself and the people who are listening to this that I haven't mentioned that you learn from, great, go deeper into, 
into um, them. The number one thing to avoid is to be too superficial, not to care, too overconfident as well. Um, big problems, big questions, big thinkers. That's the that's the task that I'm engaged in and my students are engaged in. And uh, I think it's worth the effort. Awesome. Well, uh, Michael Millerin, thank you for coming on. We really appreciate you. I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot um, and had some things cleared up for me. And as I said, I'll put all your, um, all um, for everybody listening and watching, uh, all of his links will be in the description here in a few moments here. And that way you can uh, delve deeper into some of the stuff that Michael has put out. And besides that, Michael, was there any um, uh, last parting words you want to leave us with? No, that's uh, that's all. That's all. Don't don't be. Yeah, I'll say this. Don't allow yourselves to be discouraged or dissuaded from studying thinkers that you think you can learn from just because somebody is going around saying they're fascist or you're a fascist. By the way, you might even like that they're fascist as a separate issue. Right. The point is. Pursue what you find important and meaningful and don't allow these various points of pressure to take you off that path. Uh, because there are people right now who are trying to discourage and dissuade others from seriously studying political phenomena. And you just have to be confident about your interests and secure in pursuing them and don't allow yourselves to get knocked off the straight and narrow path here of study by by everyone who's who's threatening you with um with whatever they're threatening you with yeah beautiful way to end <laughs>